Sounds like everybody is just streaming in. Welcome to the webinar. We'll get started in just one moment. And Connor, can we pull up the intro slides? Are you ready to get started? Yes. Um, thank you, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, I'd like to get everyone, um, thank, you, thank you for joining us this, today. And I will, I will just introduce myself and we will get going. My name is Alex Bonardi. I am one of the co-directors of the National Center on Advancing Person-Centered Practices and Systems. Uh, together, we are en enjoying uh, this afternoon for most of you to together to focus on uh, exploring the intersectionality of peer support and peer centered practices across disability. I will be running through a few of the logistics. Uh, this web webinar is sponsored uh, by the Administration for Community Living and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And uh, all NCAPS webinars, including this one, are free and open to the public. Uh, briefly, uh, I will say uh, for the logistics, participants are muted during this webinar. You can use the chat feature in Zoom to post questions and to communicate with hosts. Toward the end of the webinar, uh, our speakers um, will have an opportunity to respond to questions that have been entered into the chat. Uh, the webinar is being live captioned in English and Spanish. Uh, to access the Spanish captions, I'm going to put a link uh, in, the, in the chat box, which can be followed. Uh, second. Oops. And we will, and you can, you can um, follow along with the English version in the captioning. Uh, this live webinar does include polls and evaluations, so please be prepared to interact during polling times. In just a minute, I'm going to be asking for one poll to be brought up. And uh, one other thing I wanted to say is that our speakers, for the most part, are joining uh, as, as panelists. Uh, so we are um, for the most part, um, you're uh, going to be hearing from our panelists here today. And with that, I'm going to ask Connor if you can please pull up the first poll for uh, participants. And this question is, in what roles do you self-identify? And if you can please select all that apply, this helps our panelists know who we have with us here today. And if people have had a chance to respond, uh, perhaps we could share the results. Terrific, thank you. So for the most part, it looks like, well, the, the highest number is uh, social worker, counselors, or care managers. Terrific, thank you for all of you that are here. Uh, and, and you can see everybody who's taking a look at the poll results. We have people representing a broad range of, um, of experience, knowledge that are coming to this, uh, this webinar together. 
Thank you all for joining. And with this, I'd like to turn it over to uh, NCAP's uh, co-director, uh, Dr. Bevan Croft. Um, thank you, Alex Bernardi, the other NCAP's co-director. Um, I'm really excited uh, to be here and excited about this webinar. Um, it's a topic uh, near and dear to my heart and something, uh, and I'm just really looking forward to a rich discussion today. Um, so, um, as Alex mentioned, you can access the slides, which we'll just have a handful of slides, but also a fantastic handout that Martha Barbone um, created. Um, you can access both of those. Um, the link will be in chat and Connor Bailey, um, one of our project coordinators, will put those links back into chat periodically so you can be sure to have those and th these will all be on our website as well. Um, so for those of you who are familiar with the National Center on Advancing Person-Centered Practices and Systems, or NCAPS, you know that our scope is very broad and, and we're, we're somewhat unique in that we are really a center that cuts across disability sectors, across um, age, um, and we're really interested in um, services and supports for, for all people, regardless of disability identity, um, regardless of age, regardless of what system you're accessing. Um, and, and we also have a big network. So, we really see ourselves as community builders, um, uh, bridgers, pollinators. Um, and, and the goal of these webinars that we have every month, um, if, if you're new to these, um, is to showcase innovations, um, best practices, um, with the idea that we might spark some in inspiration for, for you, our community. Um, so today, um, we're hoping to um, explore peer support, um, which we really see as sort of intrinsically person-centered and really embodying um, the values and principles of person-centered thinking, planning, and practice. Um, so we have three peer supporters who are here uh, to share their experiences, and we've asked them all to reflect on how peers promote person-centered thinking, planning, and practice um, across disability experiences and identities. Um, we don't presume to represent all of the different types of peer support on this webinar. Um, rather, we're hoping to begin a conversation um, and, and get everyone thinking about how the peer support movement can be a foundation for strengthening person-centered systems, regardless of you know, um, you know, the diagnoses of the people who are served by that system. So that's really our goal today. Um, so without further ado, I'll get started. And what I'd like to do to start is invite our, um, each of our panelists to, to share a bit about themselves, their story, what brought them to peer support. So we're gonna start with, with Martha Barbone. Uh, she has worked as the Director of Certified Peer Specialist Training and has provided peer support on an inpatient unit, in a peer-run organization, um, and facilitated groups in the Veterans Administration, so lots of different um, settings. And currently, Martha is the Interim Director of the National Association of Peer Supporters. So Martha, let's begin with you and spend a little time uh, telling us about your, your peer support journey. Thank you, Bevan, and I'm so, so happy to be here today and be able to share this with everyone. And, you know, if I could have my slides, please. <laughs> um, a little bit about me. Um, you know, I didn't grow up thinking I want to grow up to be a peer specialist. Imagine that. And um, actually, my first love and career was as a veterinarian, and I was in the Air Force for about 12 years. Um, before I sort of got sidelined um, with emotional distress and, and diagnosis. And really for about the next 20 years, I, I was a professional patient, you know, in the mental health system. And although during that time, sometimes I heard the term person-centered, I honestly can't say that I ever experienced person-centered planning. And so that's much the reason why I'm here today. Um, you know, I was introduced to peer support about 14 years into that journey. And I believe without peer support, I would either still be sort of stuck in that system or, you know, even possibly not here at all. Um, because it was peer support that first gave me hope that I could live a full life instead of a limited life. 
Um, I really love the quote that's in this first slide and I, I, I liked it, so I'm gonna read it. It's amazing what you can do when you set your mind to it, especially when you're no longer supposed to have one. And this really resonates with me because like within three weeks into my initial treatment on an inpatient unit in, in psychiatry, I was told, um, despite the best efforts of a multidisciplinary team, she has failed to respond to treatment. And that was fo followed by, it's unlikely you'll ever live on your own, raise your children or work again. And at that time, I believe that because that fit was what, with what I was telling myself. I had gone for help because I felt hopeless and helpless and worthless. And now I had a doctor that confirmed all those things for me. And, you know, I became a recipient of services, not a participant in my treatment. I received treatment. I, I was a good compliant person. Um, and it didn't help a lot for many years. Could I have the next slide? So it's interesting because when we, we talk about person-centered planning, often people in the behavioral health system aren't real in tune to what that is and people outside the behavioral health system aren't either. You know, and, and the first thing we talk about is recovery. And I have the SAMHSA definition here, the substance abuse, mental health, um, services administration and, and their definition is that recovery is a process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness, live a self-directed life and strive to reach their full potential. So nowhere in that definition does it say we reduce or eliminate symptoms or that life is limited. Um, it's really open and it's it's open so much because it's self-directed. It's for me to choose what I want in life and, and find out what kind of support I need to get there. And we also approach this from what we call, you know, a recovery focused approach. And, you know, a lot of research has been now that has shown that people can live full lives, even in the presence of symptoms. Um, whereas before we used to be in sort of a maintenance model where, you know, we're going to maintain, you're going to, you're going to reduce stress in your life. You're not going to take risks and you're going to take often a lot of medication to just maintain. Um, and we're no longer satisfied with maintenance. Um, we, we strive for, for everything that you know, get back in touch with our hopes and dreams and find the supports we need to live a full life. And I must say, you know, since I was told all of those things I, I would never do, I've worked full time for the last seven years. I actually raised all three of my children on my own as a single parent. They all went to college. And, you know, I, I, I owned my own house and now I happily live in a house with my, my son and his wife. So, you know, I was really glad I got to the point where I didn't believe, you know, what I was told initially. And, and that's what I try to do in peer support is empower others. And, and we also believe not only is recovery possible, but probable. Um, there's no diagnosis that says, well, you don't recover from that or no trauma that says, gee, you can never recover from that. We always approach this from hope. Could I have the next slide? And this is just the definition again of SAMHSA of, of peer support. And peer support goes by many different names. It's most commonly in the behavioral health system with people that have what we call lived experience of either mental health diagnosis or substance use diagnosis. But it can occur, it, it happens more and more now in primary care. Um, the original version of peer support was mostly voluntary. The thing we're most familiar with are things like 12-step programs. 
um, where it's the classic, you know, peer support in a total voluntary nature. But after, for the last several years, we've sat, seen more and more employment opportunities for those in peer support. And one thing I'd say about that employment, it's often looked at, well, you can get a job doing peer support, you know, as part of your recovery and, you know, a pathway to something bigger and better. And I really want to dispel that myth. Um, one, the first thing is this pathway to employment. Peer support is a tough job. We spend our days with people who sometimes are in the worst moment of their life. Um, they might have trauma, they have other things going on, they're homeless often, they're you know, they have food insecurity, they're not employed, and we deal with all those at the same time, often sharing our own experience of those same things. And it's often taken for granted that, oh, well, if you're a peer, you share your story. And, and a friend of mine had the best comeback to that because we gladly share our story when it's relevant to support someone. Um, but often when you're on a multidisciplinary team, you're asked, well, could you share your story with the team? And this person said, sure, shared the story and then turned to the room. Now, who else here would like to share something very personal, maybe even traumatic with the rest of us right now? And I share that because I don't want people to take for granted the work that peer specialists do. And we also don't want to grow up necessarily to be case managers or social workers. We do peer support because that's what we're passionate about. And being able to connect to people through that lived experience is what helps me have purpose and meaning in my life. Could I have the next slide? So how does this all relate to person-centered planning? So in these next two slides, what you see on the left is um, the principles of person-centered practice that come from the NCAPS person-centered thinking, planning, and practice, a national environmental scan of definitions and principles. And, and the link to that is here on the slide. I think Connor's also going to put that in the chat. So on the left, like where you see here, the focus on the person and then the definition also comes from that document. And then on the right, what you see are, are the guidelines for peer support practice that come from the National Association of Peer Supporters guidelines, national guidelines for peer support. And and I've tried to match this up. So you see focus on the person and the peer support guideline is person, peer support is person driven. Peer supporters are open minded and peer supporters are empathetic and they really match up very well. And in the next one on for the person centered planning, the focus on choice and self determination. And for peer support, peer support is voluntary and support choice and peer support is equally shared power. Where in peer support, it's about the relationship. It's not a relationship where one person is receiving support all the time and one person is giving support all the time. It's a back and forth. It's mutually shared. The next one on community inclusion. A lot of what that says is embraced in the National Practice Guideline of peer supporters are respectful. And that's, you know, treating people with dignity and respect and making sure we acknowledge that they're part of a community of their choice. Then the next one, availability of services and supports. You know, the approach from peer support is always strength focused, which we also see in person-centered planning. It's not about what's wrong but it's helping someone to find out where their strengths are and what skills they have and what skills they'd like and how to get them and what supports they have and what supports they would like to have and how can they get those supports. Could I have the next slide? And we'll move on here. And 
to go on, you know, on person-centered planning that people should have information in a clear and meaningful way in order for people to understand their options and make informed decisions. And, and the comparable for peer support is that we're honest and direct and transparent. And a lot of what we do often is sort of serving as this translator to take medical terminology and information and make sure it's presented in a way that the person feels they have all the information to make a decision themselves and to support them to make that decision and support them even to ask questions about what they don't understand. Um, I'm gonna to skip to the, the third one on this, which is positive expectations. And you know, peer supporters are hopeful and we facilitate change. And, and this change comes about both with trying to facilitate systems change, as well as supporting a person to change if, if that's what they're trying to do. Um, the reason the other two don't specifically line up, the coordinated supports on the person-centered planning side talks about you know, support between different providers, different services, which definitely in peer support, we definitely believe in that. It's just the guidelines are directed more about what do peer supporters themselves do. Um, so that's why there's not a matching one. And then finally on the bottom, you see peer support is mutual and reciprocal. And I'm really not aware of any other profession that really has this idea of mutuality. And what we mean by mutuality, it isn't like if I support you for 20 minutes, I expect you to support me for 20 minutes. It's more, we both are making this relationship and we both contribute to the relationship. And sometimes I might be more in a, a supporter role, but I also get from this relationship the the relationship is meaningful to me and it helps me as well Can I have the next slide so sort of my focus actually came from reading this article that's referenced down the bottom here this article was published in 2012 and the the principal author was janice tondoro and the top 10 concerns about person-centered planning and mental health systems and and this article is actually what my handout is based on. It's these 10 concerns about why person-centered planning can't work in mental health or doesn't happen in mental health. And I look at this from 2012 and I look at what goes on today and I see much of the same thing. When I'm not experiencing person-centered planning, it's because a lot of these concerns and I think peer support can help bridge those concerns. Um, because in peer support, one of the challenges of having recovery-oriented person-centered planning is concerns about risk management and professional liability. Well, what about if, if I let this person make a decision and they don't choose well? You know, that's risky, you know, and what's my liability? And another one is that the healthcare system, when you go to the doctor or, or a mental health provider, it's office on what's wrong. So what brings you in here today? What's wrong? And it's all about medical necessity. And in peer support, our focus isn't on what's wrong. It's on what matters to you and how can I help you with what matters to you. And there's also the term I like is this medical paternalism. And you know, who really is the expert in the room? Is someone an expert because of their education and their degree and even their years of practice? Or is someone an expert on their own life because they've lived it? And it's about a collaboration of the two. It's not about one person knowing what's best for the other. It's how do we work together to have a better outcome? And the last is the respect for autonomy and self-determination. In the presence of stigma and discrimination, it really is discrimination that's associated with mental illness and substance use. And 
you know, this still comes up. And unfortunately, this stigma about diagnosis is, is really prominent in the healthcare system. It's increasingly difficult for someone that has a mental health or substance use diagnosis to actually even access good physical health care because it's often related to their, their mental health or their substance use before it's even investigated as a physical health concern. And what I did in the handout is take these 10 concerns from the article and then put how peer support helps bridge those gaps how peer support can be the filler in there. They're legitimate concerns, but peer support can help allay those concerns or bridge those questions. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to you again, Bevan. Thank you so much, Martha. Um, and yeah, just to plug in the link, both Connor and I, I think at the same time, um, reposted in chat the link to Martha's handout, which I think is awesome. Um, and we uh, please use it and um, uh, you can also access Janice Tundora's original article as well. Janice Tundora, a great friend of Ben Caps, um, another subject matter expert we work with a lot. Um, okay, awesome. We will keep uh, rolling on. Um, next, I'd like to hear from Ebony Flint. Ebony is a certified peer specialist, a peer group facilitator for Alternatives to Suicide and Hearing Voices Network and a wellness recovery action plan facilitator for adults, young adults, and trauma survivors. Um, <coughs> she works with populations in the community and in hospital settings, um, and now, right now works for Advocates Inc. Um, and she's the peer program coordinator for the Living Room, a 24-hour peer-run crisis alternative um, located in Massachusetts. So Ebony, um, tell us a bit about yourself and what brought you to peer support. Great, thank you so much. First, I wanna thank everyone for being here with us and sharing this time with us. I appreciate you all. And thank you, Martha, for your presentation. Um, so I guess I'll just share a little bit about my journey. Hopefully you all can see into my worldview and why I'm, into, I'm involved in peer support right now. As Bevan shared, I am the peer program coordinator at The Living Room in Massachusetts, which is in alternative uh, crisis space, that's 24 hours. And um, so I am a trauma survivor. I guess I should start there. My story begins at, with childhood trauma. I grew up in the projects in Massachusetts, um, looking out my window, watching cousins and family members and friends get jumped into gangs. And how I kind of avoided um, that lifestyle was that my father took me to the Roxbury Boys and Girls Club every day after school. Um, but unfortunately that didn't prevent other things from happening to me and other traumas that occurred. And so from the age of eight or nine until about 17, I suffered sexual abuse. And how I dealt with that was via self-harm and running away. And I didn't just run away from home, I, I ran away to different parts of the world, different states via uh, school. I got my praise and acknowledgement through school. And so I would join many different programs, all that I, I could and, and travel around to, and go to different schools and participate in different programs and become a new person each time, every place I went to. Avoiding and not even acknowledging the pain and the things that I had experienced. I, um, Fast forward to my 20s, and I had uh, my daughter, and that changed my life. Uh, love her so much, of course. And it also brought back up all of the trauma that I had, made me very um, overprotective and non-trusting. And um, it also ignited uh, self-harm again, which I hadn't been, uh, using as a coping mechanism for a while. Then when she turned three, she was diagnosed with autism. And at that point I was defeated. I felt defeated. It's like, <laughs> what's going on? How am I supposed to deal with this? I'm a single mom. I've never heard of this. Did I do something wrong? And um, it, took a, it took a lot of work for me to be able to help her and help me. But through 
advocating for her and fighting for her because she came first for me, I learned how to advocate for myself. And once she began speaking around the age of five, she was nonverbal until she was about five years old. Um, I chose to take the time off of, off of work. I stopped working and only focused on her and my mental health. And I did that via different day programs. I was never hospitalized, but I was in many different day programs, partials, um, and DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy, was something that actually in the beginning did not help me at all I, because I didn't let it. I didn't want. I didn't want to. But once I finally decided to do the assignments and put the effort in, by the end of that uh, time. Uh, I was running the groups and the facilitator said, you know, you should, you should be a peer facilitator. And I said, what, what is that? What, what's a peer? What, what's going on? And they told me about the uh, Central Mass Recovery Learning Community. It's now called Kiva in Central Mass. Um, and I went there and I became a peer facilitator. And I just engulfed myself in, in all of the trainings. And although I was learned, I knew that I was going to be learning these different things to help others. I definitely started with me first. When it came with my daughter, wanting to learn more about me first. When it came to my daughter, I would always say that if I'm not okay, she's not okay. And if I'm, I'm not okay, I can't bring my best self to help others or her. So I needed to be okay. So although I wanted and of course was gonna use all these trainings to help others, it was to understand me and, and help me first. And I did the CPS training, I did emotional CPR, uh, wellness recovery action plan, uh, intentional peer support, the list goes on and on and on, all the different trainings I did to um, just be learn more about myself and be engulfed in the peer movement. And um, I, I love the fact that the things, my trauma and the negative things that I went through help me, help, helps me to inspire and encourage others. You know, um, it, it's, it can be so hard because I still deal with these, with my trauma. I, there are still things that I do and that I don't do because of it. And so to be able to feel rewarded in, help, in helping others and showing them that they there is some light, you know, that you can, can that you can try. That there are things and people out there who can relate and and understand and encourage you um, brings me much joy um, and is very re rewarding. Um, in my time of working in peer support, I did have to take time off due to some physical limitations. Being that I am a younger for needing certain surgeries. I had to have spinal surgery. I've had a hip replacement. And so the stigmas and stereotypes of being my age and needing a handicap placard or having a cane or, you know, the looks and the, and then you add on all the different layers of me. It is definitely arduous, <laughs> an arduous task to be me walking in this world. And yet I still am able to use that to help and inspire others, right? Um, when I think of myself, I like wrote down all, all these layers, right? And so <clears throat> I am a single black woman with mental and physical challenges, raising a child with developmental disabilities. That is a mouthful. <laughs> And so many boxes were just checked off when it comes to disadvantages, judgments, stereotypes, lower expectations um, of being productive in the world, and higher expectations of being a statistic. It's definitely a lot to hold. And um, I love that via this work, I can share that with others and still put a smile on their face and still help them walk through their journey with them, not for them or telling them anything, but beside them. I, I just, I can't stress enough how much I love this work. I just, I just do. And, and being able to have that trajectory into this and say that I do this as a job is amazing. Um, I guess I'll end with my, with my own quote, which I think um, basically like sums up my, my journey. And that is, 
perseverance is my priority to assure my prosperity. And I just try to live with that and walk with that. And thank you all for being here and listening to me today. Thank you, Ebony. Okay, so um, uh, next we would like to hear from our third panelist, Sassy Outwater Wright. Um, Sassy is the executive director of the Massachusetts Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired. She has 15 years experience in digital accessibility fields, consulting for small business um, businesses, helping make products and services digitally accessible, and her background is in user experience and project management, and she specializes in multiple disability intersectionality. So welcome, Sassy, and share with us a bit about your um, journey, your peer support experiences. Thank you so much, uh, Bevan, for setting this up. And thank you to everybody for being here today. I'm so excited to talk about this from the disability side. We take a very different approach, um, but a very similar approach to peer support as it shows up in the recovery and the mental health community. When I was six months old, I was diagnosed with a very rare cancer of the eyes. Um, and when I was three years old, I went blind, completely blind in both eyes. Um, and I came into disability that way as a fierce young advocate and cancer kid. Um, I learned from a very young age to talk to adults. I learned from a very young age to speak my needs, to prioritize my needs, to verbalize to the medical community that I was being treated in what I needed, when I needed it, and how I needed it. That was how you got care. Um, but for the rest of the world, we oftentimes, as disabled people, get labeled non-compliant. We get shuffled into a system where we're not supposed to verbalize. We're supposed to let somebody else decide for us, and or we're supposed to become compliant to what somebody else believes we're capable of being and doing. And so I walked that line growing up of in the educational system, the special ed system, wanting things, wanting advanced classes, advocating for myself, and then being labeled a, a problem um, because I, I dared to self-advocate and I dared to say, I wanted more. I wanted self-leadership. I wanted self-actualization. I wanted self-determination. So while the term person-centered planning got spun around me, it didn't feel like it applied to me. It was person-centered. It wasn't person directed by the person who was living the disability. There was the difference between having a bunch of people in the room who were not blind, picking what I could and couldn't have, and me as a blind person saying, I could do this. Um, I could access this if I had a braille book, not an audio cassette, or I could access this if I could do it hands-on with graphics that were tactile, but I can't do it if I don't have tactile things. Um, and so I kind of walked through this constant struggle of that until I was in college and got through college and then started seeing it in my career and started doing it for other people. And that led me in 2014 to a summit um, on aging and blindness and intersectionality of those two things. Oftentimes those of us who are younger, who come into disability adjustment, and this is cross disability applicable. We come into disability adjustment at a younger age, we learn the skills to self advocate. We learn the skills to self actualize and get the things that we want. But when you come into a disability as an older adult, you find yourself locked into the idea of the medicalized system. We think of two systems when we think of disability. We think of the social model of disability where Society has to build in accommodations for the body because the body is not broken. Society didn't accommodate us. Or you think of the medical model of disability where the body is broken and we need to fix the body and society does not bear any responsibility to fix an inaccessible curb cut or um, a building that somebody cannot access. So we at now we're seeing within age systems, within disability systems, an integrative model where the medical model and the social model come together, especially for those who are aging, because they're both true. Um, 
somebody who is 75 or 85 and experiencing macular degeneration or diabetic retinopathy is going to have a tough time adjusting, is going to not know how to deal with those self-advocacy things because they've viewed disability, blindness, whatever disability they're coming into, they've viewed it from a medical model their entire lives because they've never had direct personal contact with it. So their journey through advocacy is going to look very different um, than someone who is younger. And there is going to be a massive mental health component. We call it uh, adjustment disorder or episodic depression, or it will appear as grief or anger. Um, and until you break through that, they're going to struggle to adjust. They're going to hit um, plateaus to adjustment. So I got called to the summit in 2014 around aging and, and blindness and what we could do to help older adults age um, into blindness and still find fulfillment, find actual, actualization, recover, go on to do the things that they wanted to do. Just because you lose your vision at 55, 65, 85, doesn't mean that you sit at home and you isolate and you become depressed and you fall. It means you get out in the world, you still go do the things you want to do. It means that there's no door that's closed to you. Um, and what came out of that summit was that I became, within nine months, the director of the Massachusetts Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, which is the agency that Helen Keller started in 1903 to serve the interests of the adult blind in Massachusetts. And Helen and her group of cohorts at the time were angry at the government. The government was telling us what we could, couldn't do with our bodies. As far as employment, as far as where we lived, as far as who housed us, we weren't institutional cases. We were people who could live on our own, work on our own, earn our own wages, take care of ourselves. And MAVV was really one of the first uh, organizations in the country in 1903 who went out on a national level and said blind people and people with other disabilities deserve autonomy, independence, and, and can have it. And we challenged the government and inch by inch by inch by inch, decade by decade, we won until now we're up to 2020, but we're still fighting to have an even wage. We're still fighting to have the ability to live on our own independently. Um, and so MAVV still fights those fights every day. That is why we exist as a social service organization is to continue to advocate and advance for those rights. But we brought in peer support. We decided that what we wanted at our organization wasn't a social worker or somebody else dictating person-centered planning. We wanted somebody who was 85 losing their vision to have somebody who was 65 who was losing their vision, who was a trained peer support specialist who can walk into your room and say, I'm going through it too. I get it, I live it with you. Let's talk about how you wanna watch baseball because those Red Sox are on and they're good. Or let's talk about what you're experiencing with COVID because you can't feel the markers on the floor when you go grocery shopping and now you're not feeling safe to go out by yourself. I have a couple of tips and tricks I can show you. Those practical things are what define peer support to us. The idea that somebody who is going blind, new to it, scared of it, coming in to evoke rehab system or a social rehab system and being handed a bunch of forms and goals and told to comply to these goals. And then somebody else blind walks in and sits down and says, I got you. <laughs> I've been through this. I hear you. I'm with you. It is doable. We run 37 support groups throughout the state. We have peer support specialists at a variety of levels. We have younger ones who are just losing their vision. We have older ones who have lost their vision. Um, we have ones that lost their vision as children who never had sight, and we have those who are just starting the journey. We all, they all are people who are blind, and they lead. They walk into voc rehab meetings with people. They go into occupational therapy meetings with people. Um, they meet with the optometrist with people, and they're not a buffer, but they're a support system. They're the people who say, I got you, and they teach self-advocacy with example. They teach self-advocacy with support. They teach that just because you are a disabled person does not mean you are medicalized. It means you are the leader in your own person-centered planning. Nothing about us without us, the, the old ADA adage. It means that you lead your own experience and you use your own expertise and that you learn for the first time when you walk into a meeting of social workers and case managers that your voice is the loudest voice in the room 
because you are the disabled person and you have the most experience in your own body. I remember when I was 25, um, I was diagnosed with a second cancer. I just went through my third neurosurgery two weeks ago to deal with this. But when I was 25, 12 years ago, that was a terrifying experience. I was a blind patient with brain tumors that needed to come out immediately. And the neurosurgeons had no idea how to help me. They had no idea what to do with a blind patient who had now multiple disabilities. And there was uncertainty in the room. And when you're dealing with neurosurgeons, the last thing you want floating around a room is uncertainty. And there were a bunch of residents testing me. There were nurses in the room. There were a ton of sighted people in the room. And I was the only blind person, the only person in the room with these tumors. And I flipped out. I lost it. I got angry and I called the room to a halt. I said, everybody stop. Nobody knows what you're doing with me. I don't sense any expertise in this room. Stop. I'm so scared. None of you could possibly get what I'm going through. And a nurse stepped forward and she said, yeah, I can. I got you, but you need to let us finish our testing. You need to let us prep here. And I said, no, you can't understand what I'm going through. No, you don't get it. How could you? You're sighted. And she goes, because four years ago, I had a really deep brain tumor removed that was a lot worse than yours. So are you done yet? And when she said, are you done yet? My jaw dropped. <laughs> um, and I did stop. And I looked right at her and I went, somebody else in this room gets it. There's another brain tumor patient in this room. There's somebody I can cling to. There's somebody I can identify with. If there's somebody else I can walk with who's been through this, I will be okay. I can hold on to someone's hand and I can do this. And that's the culture we strive to put into place at MAVI with our peer supports who are also disabled, who work with the social workers, the therapists, to create an integrative model of healthcare. Somebody who can safely walk in and say, are you done grieving yet? I'm ready to help you get through the next process. So that's the work that we've focused on at MAVV and we found from an intersectionality perspective that it works. It helps older adults identify and find roots and learn to self-advocate no matter where you are in the spectrum. Older or younger, it helps to have somebody who's been there, done that and leads through disability adjustment and we're the experts in our own body and we can help people gain that knowledge. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back over to Bevan. Thank you, Sassy. Mm -hmm. I am so enjoying looking at all of the comments coming in, um, in addition to hearing the speakers. Um, and one of them I just pulled out. Sass Susan says, Sassy, you are the voice of reason. <laughs> <laughs> that sums it up pretty well. Um, I'll remember uh, that when I go off and do something. <laughs> the voice of reason, everyone. <laughs> Um, all right, so I have some questions for the three of you. Um, and I'd like to start with Martha, um, and, and I'll, everyone will have a chance to, to answer these questions. Um, uh, we'll just take about, a, take about a minute or less each to, to answer each question, each question, and we should be good, um, and leave some time for Q&A from our very uh, feisty um, and active audience um, after. So, um, I'd like to ask first about, you know, thinking across disability spaces, if you would, um, what are the goals for peer support and how do we measure success with those goals? Um, thanks, Bevan. Um, you know, this, this is an interesting question because I, for me and, and, you know, again, and I'm only speaking my experience. I'm not speaking for all involved in peer support. But so often what measures success, are, like they're not relevant figures to me. They're, they're these metrics that can be pulled from a medical record. And, you know, what I experienced was, you know, about my symptoms. And, and I would love if we could get measures that measure quality of life. I would love to see data on not only if someone making their appointments, how many people have moved on and they don't need a certain service anymore or you know they've gone back to work they've done this and that and and often we don't get those numbers um, because once we start doing well we're kind of lost to follow up so you know i think you know when we we look at the goals it's so individual and 
and to lump things in and I mean, I, I come from a medical background. I believe in population medicine and things, but I so often refer to it as herd health. We do what's best for the herd, not the individual, and the individual counts. And so many programs only focus on evidence-based practice. There's great evidence-based practice, but I haven't seen any evidence that it works for 100% of us. So if we're relying on the evidence base, we're saying we don't care about the rest of you. So I guess my goal would be, can we, can we measure individual successes? And to make, today it might be I got up without being told to get up, or I took a shower for the first time this week. There was a time in my life where that was my success to celebrate versus now, you know, I, I find purpose and meaning in every day. Um, and every morning when that thought comes in my mind, is today the day I'm going to end it? No, I have all these reasons to live for. Um, Sassy, same question. What are the goals for peer support and how should we be measuring success? So at MAVV, we serve about 1,500 individuals per year. Many of them, at least two thirds of them, go through some level of peer support, whether it's one of our support groups as a larger group or individual counseling. We do do evidence-based quality surveys, but I truly measure the goal of peer support by two boxes on my desk. One is my Kleenex box and the other is a box of crayons, 128 crayons. Um, I leave the box of crayons there as a reminder to myself and to everybody who comes in my office that what looks like adjustment for one person as a blind person isn't the same for another person. When I was a kid, uh, somebody you know made a little uh, braille labeled wood thing that held about 10 crayons, the colors of the rainbow and a couple others. And a friend came over who couldn't read braille and put the green crayon where the blue crayon goes and I colored the sky green. I, my thing as a child was I wanted to color a coloring book just like any sighted kid. And my teacher praised me for doing a good job at coloring things in where they should have been, but didn't tell me that I had colored the sky green. And I got out on the playground and my friend asked, why is the sky green? And I, my face crumpled. I got really sad that I had made this mistake and that I couldn't be like what the sighted kids could be. But as I got older, I realized there's many, many shades of blue. There's many, many shades of green. And I want access to all of them as a blind person. And there are many 65, 75, or 85-year-old people who want to paint. They want to see the sky again that they used to see. They want to interact with things. And my job is to sit and listen to them and help them find a way to interact with things. So when people walk into my office and identify what they want, my job is to get them access to it. And that is the singular goal of peer support. If somebody wants to access something, it's not my job to find the green crayon. It's my job to hear how they want access to it and facilitate that. Thanks, Sassy. Um, Ebony, um, what do you see as the goals for peer support and how do you think we understand what success means? So uh, for me, when you say that, especially um, being that the work that I do at the living room, I immediately think of options, more options and alternatives, you know, these Zoom groups helping people uh, with transportation or going to them so that they could access these supports during that, this time. So when I think of goals, I just think of being even more accessible and, um, and just different way, many different ways to, to get the supports that people need. As far as how I, I measure success, or I would measure success, uh, I agree with everything that Martha said, but I also would add just that for me, it's what the, what the person considers success, what's success to them, what's hap what makes them happy, you know, um, and, and that could be a shower, that could be going out in public, that could be reconciling with the family. It could be so many different things, and that's what's so great about this work. So just whatever, for me, uh, success is whatever is um, successful to that person, that, I'm, that individual that I'm helping. Thank you. Um, all right, so my next question is about, um, you know, especially rooted in, in current times. Um, 
you know, and, and, and as we've been talking about in, in, in our NCAPS webinars recently, and, and as everyone was talking about, um, this summer in particular is marked by um, national reckoning with racial justice. Um, people are um, paying attention to and attending to social justice um, and racial justice um, in, in ways that, that um, are unprecedented. Um, so, you know, with that in mind, I want to hear from the three panelists about what the role of peer support is in advocacy for, uh, for racial equity across disability, applying, you know, thinking intersectionally about the intersection of, um, of race, ethnicity, culture, language, identity, and disability. Um, so, so interested in hearing from all three of you about um, your thoughts on that. And Ebony, this time we'll start with you. So for me, my, I first go to uh, just representation, having people that look like them, us, in, in these jobs, in, in these areas for people to want to seek the support on, on their own and feel like they, people under, the people that are supporting them understand them culturally, understand the different things that they're going through and in their lens, and that they don't have to explain so much to get that understanding and familiarity, familiarity. I also think we can help as peer specialists by helping people advocate for their human rights. We are all humans. So if we can start there in things and help people see that these are just things that I need and have the right to have and access to because I'm a human, be a human being, I think would be helpful in this time that it's so, um, it's just so hard. It, it, it's, <laughs> I don't even know what to say. It's, it's so hard in everything that we see and we feel. And um, yes, I, I, I think representation and helping to see that we're all humans would be. Thanks, Emily. Martha, um, what do you see as a role of peer support and advocacy for, for racial equity across disability? Thank you. And, um, you know, one thing that's, that's pretty evident in peer support, especially historically, but even today, is, is it's largely white. And part of that, you know, is, you know, it was originally designed by a lot of white people. And we are very welcome and opening, but often what I find, it's like, well, come into this space that's comfortable for me. You're welcome here. And I'm not asking what would make this space comfortable for you? So it's about centering everyone's voice. And, and you know, how, if we don't see people represented, how do we reach out to them? What am I, you know, what, a, what do I think that's good that's not reaching this community? And so how do I center the voice? Instead of speaking for people or doing for people, how do I support and center their voice? And, and we often, also, I'll, I'll use the word token, you know, and where we get one person, well, you can speak for, for all people, you know, and it help it, it happens, you know, I've been that as the person with lived experience. And, and I'll talk to Ebony, Ebony and I are good friends. And it's like, well, I know Ebony, you know, and so we'll ask Ebony that question. And we need to broaden that. Um, we need to be be so open that people are coming and sharing and we're centering those voices. Yeah. Sassy, same question. How can, um, what's the role of your support in advocating for, for racial justice and equity? So I've been deeply involved with the disability justice movement since 2005. I didn't fit well into the organized blind movement because I have multiple disabilities. I'm raised Arab American, I'm white, but I am part of an Arab family. And so I strongly identify as, as that. And that gave me a lot of problems because the, the community of organized, organized blind was very white. Um, so I found my place in the disability justice community, which is very uh, LGBTQ, um, BIPOC. And I, that was where I started my disability advocacy journey many years ago. And what I found was there's this idea that blind people don't see color, quote unquote. Racism is not contained in your eyeball. Racism is contained in your brain. 
And so we have a long way to go. We've started that journey, but there's a long way to go to make sure that people within our community, within the blindness community, within the larger disability community, make and hold space for people of various identities, whether it's gender, whether it's race, all of these identities need to be at the table. So if you are a case manager, if you are a social worker, if you are a peer support specialist, um, whatever role you take, look around the table. Who's not there? Who is not leading? Is an able-bodied person leading? Stop the meeting and put somebody with lived experience into the leadership chair. They belong there, period, amen and their leadership of their own disabled experience and their ability to self-actualize is what is going to shift this conversation. We need to be given leadership as disabled people. We are the ones entitled to lead our own body experience. The, the term sovereignty gets moved around a lot. We need to now experience what stepping into power and sovereignty feels like as leaders of our own experience. Thanks. Thanks, Sassy. Um, I'm glad we have a transcript of this uh, of this call uh, because there are a lot of mic drops happening. Um, folks who are wondering, by the way, this of uh, this webinar is being recorded, and uh, and we will have the recording along with the transcript and a play language summary and a summary of all of the amazing resources that are being shared in chat. All of those are going to be on our website um, in a couple of weeks. Okay. Next question, uh, I'll start with Martha again. Um, uh, no, actually, I'm going to start with Sassy. Um, how, uh, what does leadership in peer support look like? Ah, I just said it. Um, leadership looks like the ability to feel powerful in your own body. Um, one of the employment seminars that I teach, I say stride into an interview like you already have the job because you are the only one who has experience living in that disabled body. There's so much ableism and, and discrimination that happens for employment interviews because the person doesn't know how the disabled person is going to function or get to the essential functions of the job. And I say, you know, you, you have that knowledge. You know how you're going to get there. You know the technology you need. Walk in like you are the boss. Walk in like you are the expert because you know what you need to do. And they don't. And it flips ableism on its head when you walk in with that much power and confirmation behind yourself. It takes a long time to do it and it takes a long time to learn confidence like that. But when you walk in to a voc rehab meeting, when you walk into a job em employment interview meeting, when you walk into a doctor's appointment, when you walk in as the, the leader of your own experience, because you had a peer support specialist teach you what that feels like, in Martha's handout is great for this. Um, when you walk in with that level of self-empowerment, that will change your entire disability experience for you. Um, but it takes having a peer support specialist who's done a little bit of that and learning to support each other to get to that point. So that's what disability leadership feels like is peer support, knowing that somebody else can help you get to that level of self-confidence where you stride in as the boss of your own body. Thanks, Sassy. I mean, uh, and um, next, uh, Ebony, I'll, I'll take the next, take this question to you. What does leadership in peer support look like? I totally agree with Sassy. <laughs> I, I think when I gained my confidence and what I what I was dealing with and took control of my emotional wellness and regulation, that really helped me in how I was present in my different environments. And so, yes, I totally second what Sassy says. <laughs> nice. Um, Martha, how about you? Leadership. Well, yeah, I'd say, I'd say ditto too. And, you know, just to sort of build on something I said earlier, um, often people do get back to work in peer support and then, and then move on to other things they want to do and their lived experience gets lost. It's no longer considered important. They no longer share it. Mm -hmm. I want it where you know, lived experience is center no matter 
what role you're in. And, you know, in all lever, you know, even if you stay within, say, the mental health system, or, or, you know, if that's what you like doing and stay there, you know, that there's peer support at all levels of leadership. And it's honored by the lived experience. And, you know, the other thing about lived experience, sometimes it's looked at as our lived experience is our, you know, what's wrong with us, it's our disability. We bring all kinds of lived experience along with that. We're, we're parents, we're, we're spouses. Some of us have been business owners, we've been supervisors. You know, our lived experience is, is extraordinary, even with this lived experience that people call attention to. And that often gets overlooked. Um, I completely recognize. agree with that. Yeah. It's valuable. Lived experience, disability identity, they're valuable things that I want to see our systems and institutions treasure, not stigmatize. Completely agree, Martha. Great. Um, all right. Um, so I am at the last question before we go into Q&A. Um, um, so my uh, last question is, um, is a forward looking question and I, and I want to hear from each of you. Uh, what is your vision for the future of peer support? So this time we'll start with Sassy. So at MAVV, we've, we've, I run MAVV like a startup. So we did a pilot program with our peer support specialists, then we started expanding it. We have a blind social worker, we have blind and various low vision peer support specialists. But I want to see that become um, something that a lot of agencies run. I want to see mental health and blindness adjustment start talking openly. I don't want to see mental health stigmatized within our voc rehab systems within our blindness systems and our rehabilitation systems, mental health needs to be openly acknowledged if we're going to adjust to blindness at any age. And it needs to be done with no stigma and with absolute support. And peer supports are the way to do it. Blind people who have adjusted or who are adjusting and, and going through that process together, that's the future of blindness rehab that I want to see where mental health is acknowledged, destigmatized, and people are allowed to adjust on their terms with other blind people who can support them from a clinical and a social perspective healthily and with less and less and less stigma and more and more intersectionality and disability justice. Thanks, Sassy. Um, uh, next I'll go to you, Ebony. What is your vision for the future of peer support? Oh, my vision for the future of peer support is really just having it everywhere and available to everyone, regardless of what they're going through, you know? Um, for me, it makes me think of myself and my daughter because we do some, uh, we do some peer support work together. Uh, we're a part of uh, the Southern Hills Foundation has a program called Just Us Girls for girls on the spectrum. And we started with, with just participating and I would sit with the parents and she would you know, participate and do different activities with the girls. And eventually it came to, I was helping and providing um, support as being a parent liaison and my daughter is now the mentor for the, the girls in her age group. And so when I think of the future of peer support, I think of it like that in all ways, all ages, all disabilities. Uh, my daughter says we're handy capable. So just being handy capable <laughs> and making it and making this available to everyone um, in every way. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, Martha, what's your vision for the future of peer support? So I guess my vision is that peer support of all kinds is available to anyone anywhere if that's what they choose. And that that people who choose that as their life work can make a living wage doing it. Yeah. Um, you know, that peer support movement, the recovery movement is a human rights movement. And, you know, sometimes there's benefit in, in you know, what we have in common, but there's benefit in, in each and everyone's uniqueness and how do we pull all that together and move forward instead of, move forward at the expense of someone else. 
So, you know, mm. and the human rights movement, it's about equity. It's about recognizing uniqueness and differences and having equity. Awesome. Um, okay, so now we have some time to um, open up the Q&A um, from our audience. And Alex, I will pass things over to you. Terrific. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists. This has been such a, a rich, rich discussion. Great appreciation for all of you. And to all of you who have been having a very, very lively conversation in the chat. As Bevan mentioned, uh, all of this chat is being, we are capturing this and this will be available along with the recording of this um, on the NCAPS website as we go forward. So I've been doing my best to follow along with the chat and um, pull out some of the themes. Uh, there are actually quite few questions per se because people have been answering many of them, but there are some themes that I've pulled out and, and I want to put this, I'm putting it to, to any of the panelists to, to respond. Um, one of the, the, the themes quite naturally that's come through is the, the importance of relationships all the way through um, and how, how important it is to get the relationship right and then have everything fall into place. Um, I was wondering if you as, as panelists could reflect on this and also reflect on how peer supporters find the shared experience that really resonate for people um, that, that really get to the place where people can um, understand the lens that each person brings to the peer support relationship. I'll just say one thing to kick it off and Ebony and I will relate to this but it's important we have a dear friend that's no longer with us that said it's not about I, ha I know your experience or I know exactly what you feel. It's I haven't been in your shoes, but I've been in the shoe store. And that's where our lived experience, it's about what are we feeling? It's not about I've had that exact experience but I'm challenged similarly. I have those fe same feelings. I've been hopeless. I've been angry and, and we connect about that. When I was 19, this is Sassy, when I was 19, um, I had to go through massive surgery for my cancer and I went through a period of depression. I was a college student. I was supposed to be taking, you know, working two jobs, going to all these college classes and here I am having to stop my young adult experience and go through massive bone reconstruction surgery. So my mom, who is large uh, in the peer support movement, um, so I grew up around social work and peer support, um, my mom suggested that I match up with a peer support specialist to deal with some temporary depression around this. And I did, but you know, the chances of them finding a cancer patient for me to identify with or somebody you know, who had a peer support diagnosis that I felt like I could identify with wasn't really there. I didn't think it was there. And then she showed up. She said, I have HIV. And we instantly bonded because it wasn't the same diagnosis or the same disease, but it was sitting in the shoe store. It was sitting in the same room. It's dealing with hospitals, being medicalized, being told you're not compliant when you advocate for yourself. Um, we shared enough commonality where, you know, a few visits and, and she had done what she needed to do and, and supported me and I was able to face what I needed to face, even though we didn't have the same diagnosis, the same disease, we had that commonality that Martha referred to. Thank you. Ebony, did you want to add something? Yeah, no, I was just going to say that I totally agree with that um, in relating with the emotion. And that's actually what I, what I do um, with the program that I was just talking about with the Just Us Girls, because it's also with the fact that people, not everyone um, identifies, whether you have that label or not, not everyone is going to say, I'm depressed or, you know, I'm clinically depressed, but we all get down, we get sad, we get angry, you know, and so um, connecting via that instead of trying to find a specific story or experience is um, where I would stem from with that. So linking to the emotions, thank you. Um, I want to take on, uh, take it to sort of a, a different level. There was discussions that, uh, that you all brought up around um, supporting people 
at the individual level as they uh, identify and then kind of exercise their choice through person-centered models. And then, of course, the comment that, you know, identifying the choice is one thing, but there also has to be uh, the opportunity to, to take action and to have the choice be something that you're supported to follow through on. And I, I wanted to hear from you about uh, what you think about your roles uh, are as, as peer supporters in furthering choice, both at the individual level, but also at the systems level. Um, I think you touched on it a little bit, but, but how, how you see peer supporters in, in really um, so driving systems change as well. I think it's learning that you have a choice. I think it's learning from a peer supporter or somebody who's been through more of the system than you have, at least on the physical disability side, um, learning that you are allowed to have a voice. You are allowed to not just be a set of goals on paper and a plan um, or a medical report, but you are allowed to, to captain your team. You are allowed to say something doesn't feel right. Um, you are allowed to walk into a case manager's office or a social worker's office and say, I just experienced ableism. I just experienced inaccessibility. I just experienced a bad thing. And that doesn't have to be something that's off the table just because you're working on a plan of goals that you're supposed to accomplish. Setbacks can come from society. Setbacks can come from your own mental health. And setbacks are not bad things. There are things that you work through together as a team, but you, you know, as you lose your sight as an older adult, that's a process that a peer supporter can help you learn to empower and facilitate and manage because they've started it, they've been through it. Um, and that's where we really start is learning those emotional self advocacies and those trusts, those community trusts, so that you have a safe place to go and say, I just got hurt. I just had a bad moment. And then those lead to good moments. Thank you. And what I'd add is we also advocate for more choice <laughs> mm. and, and truly informed consent. And so often, actually, I'll, I worked with Bevan for a little while and looking at, at behavioral health systems from the systems perspective. And one thing I learned about was these high utilizers, you know, and, and people services were available based on how sick you were. Mm -hmm. And at the top of that chain is the high utilizers. And, you know, my perspective is, you know, as a former high utilizer, I didn't start as a high utilizer. I became a high utilizer because my, what I needed wasn't being done earlier on. And, and I think in peer support, we can bring that. It's about, it's not about where someone fits on an assessment. It's where they are right now and what they think they need and how can we get them to have it. And it's, if it's not available in, in this system, how can we get them access to it? And I think the other, that like self-directed care does that. It's like, okay, this is my money to direct my care. If mm -hmm. I want to buy a laptop so I can go to school, that's as important as going to DBT group. <laughs> Love it. I think only thing I would add is just, you know, to help others find their voice and empower them to use their voice in whatever space that they're in. I also think asking, um, just being genuinely curious, like we talk about in certified peer specialist training, just asking people questions, not even so much for us, but for them, sometimes hearing the response out loud will help people to see and think in new ways or different ways. Thank you. Thank you all. And, and, and this, again, is, is reflecting uh, some comments and like, some questions that are coming through, too, about um, person-centered uh, or perhaps person-directed um, is, is something that we really uh, we do need to focus on and more the directed part of things, both for individuals and then taking it to the system level. We, we had a question or a few questions or comments that came through earlier in the discussion also, which I want to bring forward about how peer supporters um, navigate in the world 
where they are working with and alongside, in some cases, case managers, case workers, um, social workers, and, and um, I'd just like to put it to you from your experience, uh, how that works best. If you can think of examples of, of, of when it works well, when there are peer supporters um, sort of working alongside people and where those boundaries kind of fit best. Um, for me, like uh, the example I would use would be when I worked in a, a respite and it's what seemed to work is being, being a team, even though I'm the peer specialist and I have these different set of um, ethics that I follow, still helping to educate and share that knowledge, uh, being a change agent by example, more than words, not ridiculing or saying, oh, you should try this, or why didn't you do this? And instead, letting people see the result of my different approach, and then being open and leaving the space to discuss that. Thanks, and, and I would echo that. And just in the theme of this, I think if we could apply the person-centered approach to the team where every person has equal value, every person's voice is heard and respected, um, and unfortunately, often on that team, the peer supporter is still considered the low man on the totem pole. Oh, you're one of them. And, you know, they even get asked horrible questions like, did you take your meds today? And, you know, and peer support, you know, it's a, you know, when it works well, it's a collaboration. What do we all do? The person being supported the peer supporter the rest of the team what do we all do for the best outcome where everyone has equal value and equal voice we run a variety of programs we have you know occupational therapy we have volunteer services we we have quite a few programs that people may be simultaneously involved in and the one thing that we do is make sure that nothing about us without us as a team practice so if you have multiple people, like an, a tech instructor, an occupational therapist, a peer support specialist, and a social worker who are working with the same person during the same time frame, the person meets with the team. We don't. We might meet, you know, quickly as a team behind closed doors for a, a meeting, but generally we have the person there. They dictate. Um, they drive. They are the leader. Um, and 90% of the time we see them want to reach first for their peer support specialist to, to be by their side to help them learn how to do that. So the person is the one picking the peer support specialist to say go first. Um, and we'll have the, the social worker and the OT and everybody kind of rally around them. But we, we really see that people reach for their peer support specialist as the one they want being the liaison or the buffer or the, 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 the highest person on the team. Um, and we respect that. If they ask for that, we respect that. Thank you. And, and one other question specifically about uh, some of the questions as it relates to uh, re recreation supports and recreation therapy um, spaces and how that works in terms of um, in peer supports. I'll jump in quickly. We, we run the largest team of blind runners and sighted guides for the Boston Marathon every year, Team with a Vision. And the peer support and the mental health boost that we see people get out of that weekend, we do this massive, we do a year of events, but the massive weekend, and we didn't this year because of COVID, but we've done it for 25 years. And the, the, peer, the mental health good feeling in the room as people learn they can run, they can get out, they can exercise is, it skyrockets. Learning that you can move, learning that you can empower your body, recreational therapy is critical. And all it takes is, is partnership and learning that somebody else has done it, could do it, you, it's a possibility. Possibility is, is where we put peer support when we think of recreational therapy. I would just add, I think, you know, again, often it's presented in a way of, I think you would feel better if you ran. I'll go running with you. And it's about finding movement that feels good 
to me as an individual, whatever that might be, it's not someone else deciding what movement is good for me or that a team sport would be good for me versus an individual sport. And one thing I found with people, it happened to me, I, I quit doing things that used to be meaningful to me because I couldn't, couldn't anymore. And once someone said to me, when I couldn't, there was a time if you said, well, if you could do anything, what would you do? I, no idea, nothing, you know, it was that, you know, I just couldn't think of anything I wanted to do. And they connected to me by saying, well, what are things you used to do that you don't do anymore? And then, you know, and why not? Is it something you think about doing again? And, you know, that helped me get back involved in things I enjoyed. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, we, I, I really wish we could continue this conversation for a good long while, but we, I realize we're coming to the end of the time we have and we do, please stay with us. We have a very short set of evaluation questions to include as well. But before we get to that, I wanted to be sure to thank each of our panelists, particularly Martha, Ebony, Sassy, for, um, for bringing your authentic selves to us today and to the, the panelists, uh, we, uh, to the, the uh, discussion. Um, there's been so much uh, gratitude that, that if you haven't been tracking along in, uh, in chat, it certainly is there. And this has really been um, a great learning experience for everyone. So thank you, thank you, and thank you. So with that, I would like to bring up, uh, we have a few evaluation questions. We would really love to hear from everybody who, uh, who participated. Uh, there are, you'll see that there's a little gray bar that you scroll down to get to all six of the evaluation questions. And uh, we will be just leaving the evaluation open so you can go ahead and vote. I will also say that uh, uh, there's more information coming out from the National Center on Advancing Person-Centered Practices and Systems on, uh, on our upcoming webinars. In September, we are planning a webinar on uh, person student-directed IEP plans, and there are more great ones to come in the fall. I just wanted to tell you real quick, Alex, um, one thing we wanted you to do um, was put into chat um, email addresses for the panelists in case folks want to get in touch. We have a few requests. Um, so Connor, if you could um, also, if anybody wants email addresses, Connor will put them into the chat. Um, um. Thanks. Thanks, Bevan. Um, also uh, in chat, we, we can uh, drop in our um, Facebook and Twitter names for those of you who are interested in following along with NCAPS. Um, please go ahead and follow us. And with that, I'd like to um, turn it back to you, Bevan, if there's anything that you'd like to say just to, to close us out. All I would like to say is that I'm just deeply grateful to um, Martha, who um, really worked with us to put this uh, webinar together um, and um, introduced us uh, and brought uh, Sassy and Ebony into our lives and into our community. Um, and so just a heartfelt thank you to all of you. Um, yeah, it was awesome. I learned a lot. Clearly everybody else did too. Um, so have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you, everyone.